Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along today for the show, and uh, also great to have along Karen Ballard. She's the Professor of Prog- Program Evaluation at the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Arkansas Soybean Science Challenge, an effort to engage high school students, uh, high school science students in real world scholarship and around soybean production and, uh, and sustainability. So welcome to the podcast, Karen. Thanks so much, Bob. It's good, it's good to be here. So uh, when I gave your intro and we say professor of program evaluation, uh, uh, at least my ears perked up, maybe some of the listeners did too, and saying, okay, so how did you get involved in something called the Soybean Science Challenge? Yeah, my boss wants to know that on a weekly basis <laughs> as well. Uh, it, it Kind of in an ordinary kind of extension way. One of the things I do as an evaluation specialist is work in strategic planning. And I was working with the Soybean Board, the Arkansas Soybean Commodity Board, And one of the things that they wanted to do was to do more outreach with non-traditional youth audiences so that they would understand about the importance of soybean production to the economy, where their food comes from, of course, uh, but also understand uh, as as the society was starting to sometimes demonize farming or farming practices and everybody has an opinion now that there's an internet, they were becoming more and more sensitive to the fact that they weren't a part of that conversation. And so it literally was just kind of uh, one of those situations where I was there at the right time. The other thing was that they had invested some money in a youth education program that was not done by an extension organization. It was done by an advertising agency. And they really didn't know, they'd never worked with kids. And so they, they didn't know what they were doing. They uh, did some things that probably weren't real appropriate with kids as far as collecting email addresses and leaving them laying around and, and communicating directly with kids. And so I kind of just stepped back and started having conversations with the board uh, to see if they might be interested in me working with them uh, to see how we might can leverage our resources and our experience uh, to reach that, that population um, being high school science students who had not a clue about what was growing all around them. So that's how it started. Um, And it really started from the grassroots. So I'm not, I was never a teacher. Uh, I had heard that there was something called school standards out there that were really important to teachers, but it was great to me. And so we really just started having conversations, just kind of the way it's, it's funny because I think the Soybean Science Challenge is a marriage of what Extension does best. Grassroots, needs assessment, listening to clientele, uh, and responding accordingly. It's why where they live. One of the things right out of the gate is we didn't have these high school science teachers who even knew that we existed in many cases. Uh, we didn't have high school students that were engaged in uh, AP courses and advanced science courses in our classrooms across the state that were 4-H members. This was a very, this was an audience we were not reaching at all. And so we started by, by talking, just like you're doing today with me, and listening. And and actually, the STEM coordinators from around Arkansas started giving us their opinions and giving us some ideas. And uh, so we started small. We started with uh, a, a brochure, which is what we do in Extension. We have great communication specialists. And so we decided what we would do is look at what systems already existed. We want, want to create some brand new thing. Uh, and there is a, there's a strong history in Arkansas of, of the science fairs, which in many states have those, but they've kind of got, they certainly are not in their heyday anymore, at least in Arkansas, uh, but they're still pretty big. And so I went and looked at the big awards, the 50 top awards that are given at the state science fair in Arkansas every year, and not one of them rewarded study or research-based practice in agriculture. In a state whose economy is driven by agriculture. We were not incentivizing nor recognizing the value of worth. So it's like, okay, so no wonder the kids aren't. <laughs> I mean, we're not, we're not stepping out there. We're not stepping up. And so, and it wasn't they're not stepping up. I work for the Division of Agriculture. Hello? Uh, none of us were stepping up and saying, this is really important. It's really important that you participate in the process, not just me. I, I knew from the get-go that it was more than just about showing up and giving a talk. Mm -hmm. And it was also more 
than teaching kids where their food comes from. That, that's not what we need here in Arkansas. They, they can see the fields still. They just don't understand why they're important. And it was, there are lots of debates going on that these kids are involved in, particularly through social media, you know, other forms of uh, uh, social media, the internet. And I was becoming more and more aware that students were developing attitudes by, just by anecdotally listening to young people uh, that really was negative about practices in their own state and also limit, with limited information. So uh, we began partnering with the science fairs around the state, established research awards, and then the teacher said, well, we need some content. This, we don't really know that much about production agriculture. And, and uh, it just so happened that soybeans was probably the perfect commodity crop to work with because to, to really respond to kids' diverse interests because not every kid, I mean, we don't really need a bunch more farmers in Arkansas per se. There's only so much land. We do need scientists. In fact, sometimes we're hard pressed in, in the university to recruit the, all the scientists that we need to do this research. Sometimes we have uh, positions that are, that are open and vacant for years and, and require multiple recruits. So we have a huge research-based uh, employment opportunity here for kids who are science-oriented. So we, we developed an online course. It's not brain surgery. But we wanted it to be a course that really was about Arkansas. And so we repurposed some content that the board had produced through an advertising agency. And then we focused on, it's six modules, and we focused on why this is important to Arkansas. So it's local, it's real, it's, it's relevant, and why. It's not enough just to say, you should know this, you know, agriculture is important. We really try to customize it, customize it to why it's important to you as, as a 16 year old in Central High School. And then we did modules on food because soy is used for food as a, it's, you know, all over the place now. Uh, it's a complete protein, one of the few foods that we grow that's a complete protein. We did feed, 97% of the feed uh, that, under 97% of the soybeans are used for, for animal feed, for animal production. And then fuel. Uh, we have a very active biofuels research uh, center associated with the Division of Agriculture here in Arkansas. And so we have a lot of folks that are young people that are interested in engineering, never would think they were interested uh, in agriculture or soybeans. And so we really wanted to focus enough information in those three areas. We incorporated interactive quizzes and interactive games, so they drag and drop. It's not just, it's not narrated PowerPoints. Uh, and I think one of the things we did right is that we realized that no, no one person would have the skill set to do this. I certainly don't. Um, and so we de started developing a team that said, okay, this is, this, is, this is a group that they want things interactive. They don't want a talking head. Uh, they don't want me showing up in 50 classrooms telling them why they, sh they should already know this and why it's important. They need to be able to interact with the content and, and be engaged with that. We did some videos from the firsthand perspective of local farmers that were on the soybean board. So again, put it in a face with Arkansas agriculture. Why they, and something like much of what you're doing here, like, so why are you a farmer? I mean, no real high level, just real emotionally, gut level. This is, this is what farming means to me. Uh, and it's, you know, and I'll farm in Pocahontas, Arkansas. I'm not, I'm not broadcasting this from Idaho or Florida or, you know, some other place. Uh, we, by design, did not do it overly slick uh, because, again, that's not really what young people are, are prone to, to, you know, they're, they're utilizing real-time uh, streaming. And so that's the kind of content that when we really step back and look, it's a value to them. Uh, and I would have to say that there are times that it pushed us outside our comfort. Well, because we, you know, we have great communication staff and department in Arkansas. We could have made it really slick. <laughs> and we really like to look that way. But that really contributed a formality to it that necessarily wasn't not, was not what our clientele responds to. So it took us as extension educators, it required us to step back and say, we can't do this the way we've always done it. You know, and we, it's going to require us really paying attention to what kids will respond to. 
And so we built this online course, made it available to the teachers and the students, and it's a requirement for the, te the students to compete in the research leg to complete this because it gives kids a science-based level playing field. So it's about five or six hours for students to take. It's not, a, it's not a whiz, but when they finish, they really do understand the economic impact and, and the value in Arkansas. They've got ideas about the application to medicine, the uh, application to food science, the application to, to sustainability of fossil fuels, uh, the application to uh, botany and uh, reduction of use of chemicals and they understand something about GMOs. Now, it's not a course about GMOs, but they do are introduced to, to some of those controversial topics. After we did that, we realized that that still wasn't not going to reach the broad audience that we wanted to reach in Arkansas. And so basically, we just copied uh, the Museum of Science and History's approach. Uh, I saw it out of Denver, Colorado one day, and they were doing a uh, in a very high wind, I might add, <laughs> a virtual field trip with the booms hanging out. And, uh, and it was, the sound was not very good, but it was real. And I found that even with, you know, the competing sound of the wind and being able to see the microphone moving and very unpolished production practices, I was, I was just leaning up in my seat because it was interesting. It was very interesting. And I, I really applauded their courage. I thought it was very courageous to do something uh, in these environmental conditions. And when and we were, again, talking about this concept of how do we reach these kids across the state of Arkansas with limited resources. We didn't have a lot of money. And it's like, well, we can do that. And we didn't have a clue. Nobody had ever done anything like that. So our, our first trial was... Uh, in a, a soybean field outside of a research station. We worked with 4-H students who helped us test all, all the devices because we knew we weren't ready for prime time. And we had a boat battery to back up our computers. Uh, <laughs> so we, had, uh, we actually pulled uh, blankets out of cars and pinned them up because under, the, uh, under our tarp because the wind was too high. And, uh, but we did it. We actually broadcast and we actually, the students liked it. They engaged. And so we started with that pilot that was, we had about 50 participants. And then we went to a full, full range. Anyone in Arkansas is invited uh, in September, that following month. And we did it in the middle of a soybean field in Pocahontas, Arkansas with uh, MIFIs. And we had two because we didn't know where this was broadcast from. We weren't sure which one would drop first, but probably one would drop. And so literally Mary, who you met earlier, uh, went out to the field and just held my thighs up to determine which was better and, and uh, literally had to drive in because there were no hotels that were even close. Uh, and we broadcast that day to over 400. So we went from 50 to 400 in a matter of a month. We knew we had something because we got lots of engagement and interaction with these young people. So this last year, uh, we decided, okay, what's controversial? Because it's not just enough to talk about soybeans. I mean, who cares if you're 18 or 17 or 16? I mean, really, we gotta be honest with ourselves. And I think that's the biggest challenge in this whole process for me as, as an older uh, educator uh, is, but I think my work as an evaluator has helped me because it's like, we've got to be honest with ourselves. We, you know, we can't do this the traditional way that Extension has ever done this. And we've got to be willing to fail because nobody else is really doing this very much, right? not with schools. So there's, there were lots of challenges like, what time do you do it? And we found that Arkansas um, has about 15 different school schedules, different class schedules. So narrowing down to a time. So our production time was cut down to about 35 minutes. Because there, there was no, no more time than that that overlapped in our schools. Mm -hmm. And then it was, so what's hot? And fortunately for us last year, Chipotle came along. <laughs> and, and again, it's like paying attention to what's going on in the contemporary environment and what are kids talking about and what's in the news. And uh, Chipotle came out non-GMO, demonizing GMOs, uh, and holding themselves up and using this as a marketing campaign, a whole huge both digital and uh, multimedia marketing campaign, uh, playing to a higher level, inferring a, a value that scientifically doesn't exist. Uh, now, 
I'm, I want, don't want you to hear that I'm pro-GMO or I'm a GMO scientist. I'm not. But I'm certainly anti-using the abuse of science in that kind of way for marketing. And so one of our goals is that, that we're not going to, uh, number one, we can't tell kids what to think, particularly these teenagers, older teenagers. But we can teach them to think critically, and we can challenge them to look at both sides. And certainly GMO offers multiple sides. It's a great topic because there are multiple dimensions to this debate and this discussion. Um, so we took on GMOs, and we, we, we met with our plant pathologists who are doing GMO research in Fayetteville. They're younger scientists, so they were game to do this wild and crazy thing. Uh, we had a team of about 20, a core team of about 25 of us who had different skill sets. Obviously, I'm not gonna be the one doing a lot of technical stuff. So our team had to be younger. We had to have team members that are, you know, early professionals who uh, are willing to take risk, not worried about ruining their career and embarrassing themselves yet. And uh, so we got the younger ones who are willing, the older ones where it doesn't matter anymore if I embarrass myself. <laughs> and, and it takes, I think, that kind of combination uh, because this was untested. And so we went from, we didn't know uh, Zoom was a new technology at that time. We helped test it uh, when it first came out. Our IT director, you know, asked us to start playing with it. But we didn't know what's the system capacity. What could possibly be overload? We had to deal with the, the challenges of schools who have all kinds of uh, firewalls and restrictions on software and thing, any software having to be approved all the way up to the, the superintendent or even the school board. And so it took about two to three months, we learned, of leave time to be this uh, spontaneous. <laughs> uh, but it's worth it. I mean, it's worth it. You've got to respect that the schools have uh, a role, a serious role to play in protecting their students from things that they shouldn't have access on the internet or, or predators on the internet. Uh, so it was about, again, the old fashioned extension skills of building partnerships and being a trusted and respected source uh, with the, the State Department of Education who sanctioned this, with all of our STEM coordinators who sanctioned this, none of which got money, by the way. That's, who, that's when you can tell uh, who your real partners are. And then, then down to the schools and science teachers and technology assistants uh, who were critical in making this happen on the other side. To make a long story short, uh, we were sitting around the table one day talking about uh, in August of that year, last year, uh, vegetables was eat, uh, were eaten on the space shuttle for the first time, space station. And so someone said, well, we could call NASA and ask them if they want to broadcast from the space station during our broadcast. It was like, yeah, ha ha. Uh, but our director of communications did call NASA and actually was connected, uh, got called back uh, by the director of uh, the Veggie Project, who is responsible for taking vegetables to Mars and was responsible for the growing of vegetables on the space station and the broadcast live of the scientists actually consuming them for the first time in August of last year. So uh, we went back and forth many times, but they agreed that uh, they would like to participate. So actually, we got a new partner at the 11th hour, uh, who uh, Trent Smith from, from NASA, who broadcast live from the Kennedy Space Center and opened up our virtual field trip. Uh, this increased, so we had NASA with the Veggie Project and GMOs. I mean, how good can it get? Uh, so... Uh, we had a uh, broadcast site set up in uh, the GMO lab at Fayetteville. We had a broadcast site from the research greenhouse in Fayetteville. Uh, and we had uh, a group of tech stranglers here in Little Rock who were interacting with the kids. We had about 15 of those scientists and educators interacting with those kids live as they submitted Q&A. Mary Poling, our uh, digital media coordinator, producing the whole thing from Little Rock while we broadcast from Fayetteville and NASA. So uh, it was very fast paced. One of the things we learned is you need some video to keep it moving so you don't have even 20 minutes of a talking head it can become very uh, annoying. And uh, we, so one of the scientists actually took his gene blaster and had a graduate assistant videotape the, the process of putting the Petri dishes in and out, turning the machine on, blasting the gene, pulling it out, making some modifications, putting it back on. So while we were broadcasting live, the researcher was able to 
show the video and do voiceover and talk about this is how GMO is created. This is how we do this. There's different methods, but this is the way we do it in our research lab here in Fayetteville. Uh, we got 405 questions from those students that participated. We went from 40 or 50 students in our first broadcast to over 400 participants in our second broadcast to over 1,700 students in our third broadcast uh, with over 2,000 total participants. That include teachers and, and educators. Uh, but over 1,700 kids joined us live uh, from across Arkansas in uh, Texas and Pennsylvania. We don't, we're not sure, quite sure how they found out about it because we did not, we didn't offer it. We didn't open it um, because again, we were still not sure what Zoom, what the capacity of Zoom could be. Uh, so we were up near between uh, almost 70 schools that participated, 70 live remote sites that participated. And we didn't really have any issues. Some, uh, some schools, one or two had a couple of issues, but by and large, the, the Zoom technology for us, what you use, Rob, has been a game changer, mm -hmm. both from the production side, which doesn't require much of anything, to the, to the people on the other side who are participating. And to me, that's the magic of, of this technology and this method and this approach is that it has to be timely. It has to allow for some interaction and the ability to use video or pictures. Uh, we found that the kids want to see it. They want to see what we're talking about. And so that's why we also decided we had to have multiple locations. They, they need to see the greenhouse. They need to see the scientists, you know, with, with the soybeans growing behind him, talking about, you know, how genes change, how you modify gene, uh, genes, and just the basic biology of uh, genetic modification uh, and genetics. So it's not, the goal is not flash and dash and just being uh, spontaneous, but to really embed very important basic science in these lessons, but also make it relevant, timely, uh, and interesting. And to let them be involved in these questions. I mean, we had everything from very high level questions that students submitted that I was truly amazed at to uh, let the genes run or let, let, the, let the beans go free. <laughs> so still holding on to uh, feeling that we're, we're somehow abusing these little beans. But that's okay. I mean, that's part of the discussion. And it's, it's um, the teachers have been incredibly responsive. And uh, that's one of the things that has been pretty exciting to me is that it has given them some resources and tools that uh, make it come that help them make this come alive in the, in the classroom. With the next generation science standards, that's one of the things that the standards really emphasize is it needs to be applied science. How does this apply to your daily life? So, you know, we were able to, with, uh, without spending a lot of time, but refer to Chipotle. Uh, and we created a teacher's discussion guide that we sent out, the old fashioned printed guide, as well as having it on our website, so that teachers actually had the tools to discuss this very complex topic, but discuss it uh, in a way that um, was engaging and intriguing and told both sides of the story. In order to continue to have the this, this teachers, I mean, the first time I walked into a group of um, uh, STEM educators, I had one guy raise his hand and he said, uh, and I was talking about the fact that our young people didn't know much about agriculture, certainly didn't understand all the careers that were available and the science, the key science behind this. And, and I said, you know, we've got issues and, and with sustainability and we've got issues with uh, disease resistance. And this one teacher in the back, big, big guy raised his hand, kind of smug, said, didn't you create that problem? <laughs> and it was, it was great. I loved it. I said, uh, probably, yeah, you're probably exactly right. And that's exactly why we need these young people, the best minds in Arkansas, to understand that for to be sustainable, we can't just say we've learned it. We, we got that, um, which is what we do as adults. It's just kind of what we do. Uh, but to say, yeah, that is an issue. That is a problem. Of, and science is an evolving knowledge and understanding. And conditions change, science changes with it. So to really, again, engage this, both the science teachers and the students in understanding um, 
that this is real. This can be critical to their, there's lots of doors to, that, that they can pursue. It's really important. And so we really try to hit on things that we thought young people would care about, like um, who gets to eat. And the whole issue of GMOs is not just a good and bad issue. Whatever decision you come, you know, whatever side you come down on, and there's more, more than two, there, there are consequences to those decisions. And so that's one of the things that we, uh, how we engage youth. It's like, okay, we want teachers, we want you to ask them to debate this in class. That's a topic for debate. And, and again, the next generation science standards are about argument, scientific argument. That's one of the, the thresholds of uh, one of the standards is that they're able to apply and argue and see different perspectives. Uh, so if we have, you know, the Bill Gates Foundation has certainly come down solidly in, in their mission to address world hunger, pro-GMO, and they've taken quite a bit of flack for it. And so we, we introduce that. Okay, so the Gates Foundation is doing this. This website says this. Basically, if you reduce the, the yield by 40% in what the World Health Organization is telling us, is that we're gonna to need to increase production in order to feed the world population by this percent. This percent's not gonna get, it's math, it's basic math. So who doesn't get to eat? And what, what are the risks? What are the variable risks here? This is a certain risk of starvation. Uh, and this is, this is an estimated risk. Still valid, all valid concerns. So again, getting people, young people to kind of think about that because they do care. We're just not very imaginative, I think, in helping them see where, where it affects them because they're going to be making these decisions. And that's the other thing. It's like, this is not a, a hypothetical situation. Whatever you vote on, whatever you decide to do, uh, you know, organic is, is a choice that a lot of uh, Americans make right now and, and a lot of folks in the European Union. Uh, but it's a high cost choice. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean because that's our preference, those with lots of resources, that children or, or old people are going to starve because that's the only choice that we decide in our affluence that, that we're going to make available. And so it's been, it's, and it, I had a young person call me um, last summer on my office phone, and her name is Amara, and she's not, uh, she's a, an immigrant from Egypt, and she uh, had attended Central High School, which is a, the largest high school in Arkansas, in AP science courses, and she got involved in the research, and one, the whole point of our program is that students co-create knowledge, and so we want them to be talking about their research and presenting their research, and to uh, be engaged in this process. And she said, well, Dr. Ballard, uh, my dad and I just watched a TED Talk when we were driving across the state, and um, what I've decided is I want to study the influence of soy isoflavones on angiogenesis in the treatment of cancer. And uh, Bob, basically I said, uh, with much humility, well, Number one, you're going to have to email me that link because I can't, don't think I can spell angiogenesis. And I have not a clue what a TED Talk is. And uh, so I will help you in any way that I can. I can mentor, and I've got lots of friends that are scientists. Uh, but I don't have a clue, almost anything that you said, <laughs> just, just now. And it was the truth. And so she did. She had already been in, in touch with the uh, Direct, scientific director of the National uh, American National Center for Angiogenesis, and they had emailed her to her back, and, and um, uh, I was able to connect her with some scientists who were amazed that this was a 15-year-old talking to us. Uh, and she came back last summer and actually was able to do six, work, six weeks of uh, mentored research in uh, a, molecular, a molecular lab in, at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. This is a young girl who had never been to a soybean field, not even to a farm, but was intrigued with the science behind this in the application to her life and her pursuit of, of medicine.
she will study medicine, but I guarantee you, she will always be interested in soy because of some of these early things. Her mom, mom and dad, her dad brought her, uh, met him to meet him on the campus at Fayetteville when he was dropping off his 15 year old for six weeks, which just horrified me um, and made me very nervous. So we, we immediately began texting every day for her six weeks there. Uh, and he said, I just want you to know that her mother and I believe that this has changed the fu Amara's future. This has changed her life. That she was not aware of her surroundings and certainly uh, no connection to agriculture or the environment in any significant way. She always saw a straight trail. She's always been a very bright young woman, but she was totally disconnected with agriculture in the world that evolves around agriculture and, and the importance of that. And um, so that was my, okay, it's kind of been worth all this moment. It's been worth uh, the starts and the stops and the, I don't, this could go bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally I had to pause for a moment thinking that we were going to broadcast to 2000 people, some out of state about GMOs and to, you know, last year and to show a gene blaster, you know, I had to pop because I know that other scientists have come under attack. Yeah. Those very, you know, for much less than that. Um, but I think that again, if we're going to really engage, particularly these non-traditional audiences, then number one, we've got to do what to what Extension's always done well, and that is go where they live. And our young people don't live um, just in their houses anymore or just in their classrooms anymore. They live online. And it's not a matter of whether we like that or we don't like that, but, and they're not real impressed with our videos in extension <laughs> that are 50 minutes long <laughs> and our talking heads, our narrated PowerPoints. Um, not really gonna listen to that very long. And so it's been an incredible challenge to humbly acknowledge that what we produce is not what they consume and try to find a trail for how we can do a better job. And it's, I have, I've had an amazing team to work with. It's just been amazing, the gifts, the people, the generosity of spirit, and the, oh, I can do that. I mean, our IT director literally brought his boat battery from home to give us that backup power source. I mean, that's the spirit and the, the uh, generosity that, that has surrounded us. The, the willingness of NASA to just step in at the 11th hour and be a part of this with a group of people they never even met. Uh, and also let us be in control of, of the broadcast, <laughs> which, which was something we kind of uh, required. It was amazing. It was amazing. And so great partners, again, doing, you know, using the, the knowledge and the skills of great extension educators to network, to listen to, to local needs, uh, to have good research-based information. Uh, our challenge, and I think it's, it's all of our challenge in extension, is how we deliver and how we deliver uh, in a little more sloppy way, if I could be quite frank, in a little more informal way, still being committed to research base, uh, but also being willing to jump, to step out into the dialogue and the debate that's swirling around us right now about all kinds of issues with agriculture. And more than not, we're not, our voice is not in that room. Uh, or if it is, it's defensive. And that's just natural, it's normal, it's kind of what we do as human beings. Uh, but to really engage these young people in, in number one, understanding and acknowledging that these are very important issues. What you eat is very important. Uh, we also have a leadership role in the world. And so what's political, what's science-based, you know, number one, no one has the absolute answer to that. Uh, but how do we engage uh, in a conversation that is respectful uh, and supported with science? And to be, to, again, Chipotle gave us a great uh, example of, number one, elevating a marketing campaign on pseudoscience and then having to deal with a catastrophe related to food science. Uh, and, and the true, what are the true risks here? Uh, in relation to this organization. And, and 
not making, not demonizing Chipotle, but there are true risks to eating food. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know, whether whether you grow it or whether you buy it, there are you know, there are tremendous risk, and you need to understand your food. So it gave a great platform to say, yeah, it is important to understand your food, and it is under- important to to understand risk, uh, and how what are those, you know, uh, and again. Um, it's been a, it's been an adventure. I would say that I've learned more than the kids probably have, and uh, uh, it has just been. It's it, I, I've grown to respect and appreciate my colleagues. Everything from stuffing soybeans in a bag to send them to kids to plant, to uh, uh, you know holding beans and standing out in fields and being willing to uh, do things that they've never done before, and, and certainly not in these ways. From the lessons that you've learned through the the project, are there are there ones that stand out that uh, might be helpful to an agent or a specialist out there who you know might not be working on a soybean program or even an ag program, um, but just you know what can you tell them about how to approach whatever programming they might be working on uh, in a way that maybe can lead to to you know some small. Uh, part of the success that you've had? Be willing to copy. Great ideas. Uh, If we hadn't been willing to look at the Denver uh, Center for Science and History and say, they did it, we could, we could do that when, and um, then willing to understand that you don't have to know everything. You don't number one, you're not, you don't have to know how to do it. But in extension, there's probably some people, and it's usually the younger ones, to be quite honest, that are going to be the ones that's going to help you the most. Now, the younger ones need the older ones help as well, re- relating to relationships and organization. So it's a real natural partnership. So I would say to really have a diverse group that you start working with and understanding the skill sets that each of those age groups and generations brings to the table uh, You've got to have a team that ego has got to be put down. It's got, it's got to be set aside, and, it, and the roles on the team cannot be based on your position or your tenure or, you know, de- deference. I mean, people have got to be able to say to you, oh, that was bad. Or you can't teach. They're, going to, they're not going to listen to you. <laughs> or we've got to have better pictures of bugs. I mean, they've got to, these are not good pictures. And we've got to have a video, and that 20-minute video has got to be two minutes. And, uh, and we got to have a script on some of this because we got, we got this, it's got to fit to a time slot. So it requires the, that live spontaneous education, if it's a production for a classroom, requires a lot of preparation, much more preparation than most extension uh, presentations because we've got natural pr- educators who are great on their feet. Now for, for more of the, so if you're doing production that's going to be infused into classrooms live, then you're going to want to make sure that it's interactive. So there's got to be that, you've got to have text wranglers who are able to allow those young people to interact with you. It's not just delivery. So interactivity, teamwork, making sure you ha- uh, leave your ego at the door. And if you're doing other things, which we have, I haven't done so much, but we have some young agents that are doing this. They're, they're using Twitter uh, in those very brief videos. So you can do that on your iPhone or your iPad and with, with very low cost, very simple editing uh, that the average educator can learn to do, I believe. Uh, and just what's going on? So if you're, it depends on who your audience is. You know, how, how you craft. Again, it goes back to the needs of the audience, not what I know how to do. So who's your target audience? What needs are not being met by someone else? It's not just about needs, but what needs are not being met by, where's the hole, where's the gap? And figuring out a way with their help, you know, they got to want it, how to fill that gap. And so we started, we actually started talking to our science teachers about GMOs before Chipotle, before the catastrophe. But that just helped us because we knew the kids, it was all spinning. It helped us make our decision. Uh, watch and pay attention to the media, to the, to the internet. If you're wanting to, whatever is spinning around in our virtual world is what people are paying attention to. So it doesn't matter really what your content is and extension. Yeah, we have a huge range of content, but making it relevant to current affairs, because it's, you got to remember that we work 
We work and live in a virtual environment. Just look at reality TV. That tells us about what our clientele want. Now that may offend us. <laughs> we may think we're above that, but that's, that is our clientele. It's, it's, we, they have the ability to have immediacy. We've never had that before. Uh, and it's not going away. People respond to immediacy. So how do we make our content, whatever it is, immediate and relevant? Uh, and it's not going to be in a fact sheet this day and time. Fact sheets are still good. There's nothing wrong with them. And there's some people that still will use them and want them. But, but if you want to reach that audience, who, who, who do I need to look to? If you want to be the extension agent specialist, that is the first thing someone thinks about. It's like, who's doing this and who's doing that? And who's my partner in this? Or if there's a crisis, they'll have the resources I need. Then you've got to be able to produce them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't just deliver a virtual field trip, even though that's gotten a lot of attention and play. We have a whole array of very traditional extension resources, teacher's guides and brochures, but they're posted. We're not, we're not printing a whole lot of them. If we print, it's very strategic because it's expensive, but that's not necessarily the way they want to access them anyway. And, and to continue to listen, it's not, it's not you go do a needs assessment and then go back and work, which is kind of the way we've worked in the past. But with digital technology, you don't have to do that anymore. You can have some real give and take. One of the things that as we launched the, the, seed, the soybean science challenge, we started getting communications, email. They didn't call us. They didn't come into our office. They're not going to do that. Science teacher, not going to drive to Little Rock to do that. But I got this email, kind of a little curt, like, so how are we supposed to find these seeds? <laughs> so if you want our students to do research, where the heck, I mean, we're not going to buy a bushel of soybean seeds. How can we get, you know, 100 seeds for our students to do a class project? Mm -hmm. I never thought about that. You know, our, our traditional clientele have them laying around in their, in their barns. Right. So it's like, oh, I don't know. How do we get, you know, 100, 200, 300 seeds? And they're wanting different varieties. So how do we do that? So we partnered with our, uh, the, our key seed researcher out of Fayetteville, a different town, different city, two and a half hours drive away. And he said, well, we'll do, we'll do an online store for them. And they can choose from three different varieties, up to 500 seeds. We'll have different. And it'll just be an online form, and we'll ship them to you. And it's like, so how much is that going to cost? We'll just do it. We'll just do it for you. This is good. So we now have an online seed store that none of us thought of ever. And I don't think we ever would have, honestly. It's just not, it's not our world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but now I, before I came over here to, to talk with you today, I looked on my, my email and there's a little seed store order that I get copied on. I don't, I'm not involved in it. It's gone to the researchers lab and the, that lab will be shipping that school today seeds. And they can get uh, conventional seeds. They can get non-GMO seeds. They can get uh, Roundup uh, ready. So we're giving uh, the science to the kids. It's like, oh no, we don't. We don't want to get into that Roundup issue. Well, yeah, we probably. I mean, if we're going to ask the kids to research, then they need to compare conventional to GMO to non-GMO to food grade, and that there are differences in those seeds. And so that again fuels the the, the scientific discovery and understanding. It's not just a seed. There's all different, different kinds of varieties and different choices. Um, so it has been, um, I would say that's the, that's the thing is that having that ongoing, again, traditional extension tools and skills, but not, I think used to, we'd do a needs assessment and then we'd go back and we would produce, a, develop a program and then deliver a program and then evaluate at the end. This is an ongoing dialogue. So we're starting, this is, you know, how is it really? We really want to know. And, and you know, some schools had technical issues. And we really explore this. Like, oh, no, it didn't work. Well, if you're out there far enough on the edge, some of it's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's our learning opportunity is what didn't work. And we did, after we did our first uh, virtual field trip with our 54 uh, H'ers, uh, we, we debriefed, had a great debrief. What went well? Because, you know, we do have an ego at least. We would still want to know that all this effort meant something. And what, what did we learn? And we learned a lot from that first session. 
Uh, we learned that people should be in different places to really provide the best support. Uh, we learned that there are, there's, we need to test with schools because, you know, not everybody uh, knows what Zoom is, not even though it seems simple and intuitive. We've been working with it for six months, which is, mm-hmm. at that time was not a long time. But, you know, if someone's just logging in for the first time, they probably don't need to log in at the time of the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> they probably need to have it tested. And so our, our folks, uh, Mary Poling tested with the schools that wanted to test. It wasn't required. We didn't have this huge list of requirements. But we had lots of, of preschool, how do you do this? You know, uh, information, not preschool, but pre-broadcast. Uh, very clear tutorials that went to schools with pictures and, and to make sure that they got the best support they could because they were also, we were asking them to partner with us and doing something that could be a true waste of their time because <laughs> they had never done it either. Right. So uh, thinking about it from that perspective as well. Well, Karen, uh, thanks so much for joining us and for sharing the story of the Soybean Science Challenge in, in Arkansas. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It's been a joy. Karen Ballard is a professor of program evaluation at the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture and Cooperative Extension Service. And uh, you've been listening to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, If you want to get in touch with us, hit us up on Twitter. It's at WDNEXT. You can find all of the broadcasts at soundcloud.com slash working differently and show notes at bobbirch.com. The WDIE theme, Working Differently in Extension. I don't know if I've used that acronym before, but it just popped out, uh, is uh, performed by New, it's, it's called Noon's Acid, and it's performed by And Nobody Cared. It's used under a Creative Commons license, and you can find it at gemendo.com. Thanks again for joining us. We'll talk to you soon.